This women's movement was especially effective in Kansas. They associated prohibition with so many social and political issues, it was impossible for politicians to ignore. In the 1880 state elections, Kansans became the first Americans to vote in a dry state. The prohibitionists had won. It was now illegal to manufacture or sell liquor anywhere within the state borders. For Governor St. John, this marked a victory for the forces of civilization. We now look to the future, not forgetting that it was here on our soil where the first blow was given for the emancipation of a race from slavery. This second emancipation shall free the soul of man. Now, as in the past, the civilized world watches Kansas and anxiously waits the results. With the saloons outlawed, Kansas became even more attractive for pious settlers. My parents, tailors, came to Kansas from Missouri because Missouri had saloons and he wanted his family to grow up in a state with no saloons. Now that's true of a large number of people who came to Kansas because there were no saloons and far less drunkenness. Taxes were lower, less problems with poverty, jails were empty. If you can reduce drinking, you can reduce all kinds of social, economic problems. Kansas turning dry sent reverberations across the nation. In the next 10 years, by 1890, five other states in the Midwest and New England had followed Kansas and voted to ban the liquor trade. But it was not that simple. Borders could never be sealed, and alcohol leaked into dry Kansas every time a train passed through from the neighboring wet states. The demand for liquor was still there, and illegal saloons met the demand. This sickened one member of the women's union. Her name was Carrie Nation, and she vowed to smash every illegal bar in Kansas. Nation was driven by a personal tragedy. Her husband had died an alcoholic. He had widowed her when she was just 21. From that moment on, she swore to rid America of saloons. Picking up her Bible and her axe, Nation began her campaign of hatchetation. On one of his early cameras, Thomas Edison made a film publicizing her cause and her method. My strength was that of a giant. I tell you, ladies, you don't know how much joy you will have until you begin to smash, smash, smash. She wrecked bars throughout America. She was arrested and locked up countless times. But to prosecute her would be to admit to the illicit saloons. She was always released after a night in jail. Her frenzied behavior made sensational news copy from coast to coast. She was shown as a lunatic and a freak. She became an embarrassment to the women's union. But the idealists in the small towns like Enterprise in Kansas welcome nation. My Aunt Ka Catherine Hoffman was really a, a liberal, progressive person ahead of her time. Uh, she wrote uh, Carrie a letter inviting her to Enterprise. And Carrie came to Enterprise and spent the night with Catherine Hoffman. The next morning, the two other women and she, with many supporters, marched down the street uh, singing. And they, they went to the bar and Carrie took her axe. This is the actual axe. Uh, and smashed the door in and went inside, followed by the, the lady with the veil. She smashed all the bottles, mirrors, and uh, the bar itself. Uh, and
and came out. My aunt, uh, Catherine Hoffman, stood at the door guarding it as uh, Carrie smashed the saloon. Nation didn't mind if she was seen as a freak or a fanatic. Her exploits attracted widespread support from the Protestant middle classes of Kansas. But the railroad was bringing a new threat to their dry world. Europeans from drinking cultures arriving in their thousands to work in the countryside. 25 million immigrants arrived in America between 1885 and 1924. Many headed out to find work in the open fields of rural America, but all they found were the sunless, imprisoning mines. To many middle-class Americans, it seemed as if these men would violate their strict codes of piety, carefully built up over a generation. The railroads brought in people from Russia, people from Germany, many of them who had a, came out of a drinking culture, brought it with them. And uh, uh, so there was all di difference of opinion, but uh, like a, it's one more thing in politics, you battle. Uh, and there are certain snobbishness, you kind of look down on them. Second class people, you know, the miners and all. I'm sure there was some of that. I don't remember feeling it much, but that's part of that's human nature. Uh, Kansas was changing. As farms in the rural wilderness disappeared into the industrial landscape, coal mines and steel mills scarred what had once been prairie. For the immigrants, it was hard work for small wages. Every day, they risked their lives working long hours in the deep shaft mines. A drink was a small comfort in this cold, stone-filled world. The workforce were housed in mining camps. Johnny Marietta lived with his family in one known as the Balkans in the southeast corner of the state. Well, my dad came over here from Italy, and uh, at that time, there was mostly all of them coming from over in Italy, Germany, and France over here to work in the mines. It was mostly foreign people that worked in mines, and my dad came over here, and he worked in the mines, and then sent for my mother. My mother come over in a cattle boat with her clothes in the gunny sack to come over here, and she was here, and we had a little place down there in Cherokee County, and then we started a little bit of a store. I had a little bit of a store. My mother sold a had a little bit of old grocery store, and then they like the house. You go down, and everybody's selling a little bootleg and a little whiskey in the houses, you know, at their homes. They had. That's how you buy half a pint, you know, and then they had a jukebox in there, and some of them, uh, most generally, had an old guy playing accordion or something, you know. And it was, they had a hell of a time on a weekend for $2, you know, you could have a, a big time, you know. When he was eight, Marietta was sent to one of the immigrant schools to learn how to become a true American. The old settlers were determined to bring these newcomers around to their way of thinking. The women's union taught the American way, sobriety as well as respect for the flag. Sarah Boyd and her mother were members of the women's union. Every town in Kansas had a WCTU, and um, one of the programs that they had was to help uh, immigrants to become Americanized. And in this little town of Mulberry, Kansas, there was an Italian establishment. And mother went down there every day and taught English to the people who were there and helped them uh, in their spiritual lives as well as their moral lives. Many middle-class Americans feared that their own moral values would be overwhelmed, corrupted, dragged down. For many, prohibition became a control mechanism, something to enforce their values on this diverse babel of immigrant invaders. The prohibitionists pursued a dream. Their movement would usher in an idyllic golden age, 
where happy workers and families would live in a peaceful, brave new world. But immigrants came to America's cities with their own dreams. They came seeking freedom, escaping poverty and tyranny in Europe, only to find the ghetto and more controlling dictates. The prohibitionists, the growing ethnic enclaves of the great cities, built on the back of the mass migrations, were strange, dangerous, and beyond their control. Cities in this livid imagination became synonymous with sin, places of moral and physical degeneration, and the cornerstone was always drink. The saloon's very existence was a frustrating reminder to the Protestants that their new world was no earthly paradise. These men were lost souls, men who surrendered themselves to drink and the growing power of the liquor business. Control a man's thirst and you controlled his vote, too. For prohibitionists, the saloons were a breeding ground for anarchy and conspiracy. The saloon keeper with his growing political power was a threat to middle-class democracy. And behind every saloon door were not only drunks and cheats, but a gigantic and expanding brewing industry. By the 1900s, German dynasties like Anheuser-Busch had expanded their operations and opened up massive plants across America. New technologies allowed mass-produced beer to be transported around the countryside in larger volumes than ever before. The brewers understood that drinking was a matter of persuasion as well as appetite. Their advertising became slicker and more sophisticated. Beer was good for you. The kids liked it. And the ladies liked it too. With increased profits, breweries were able to buy their own saloons and control the brands they sold. Saloon keepers were now tied to large and powerful foreign organizations. In the areas, the pockets of America that were predominantly German, uh, you were almost, you could, you could feel that you were back in Germany itself the umpapa bands on Sundays, the beer gardens, the family atmosphere, the songs, the real social drinking with no, uh, no desperation about it, no idea of getting drunk. Uh, you drank because you enjoyed the beer, and the beer was pretty good. It was made on the premises by other German-Americans. And uh, it was the weekends were, were long social, cultural parties. But one person's party was another's idea of chaos and disorder. For the prohibitionists, tavern life epitomized the decline in moral and social order that so many Americans had feared. 